and Cherries fans, and welcome to this latest special show here on Up the Cherries in All Departments. Before we welcome on our special guest, here is a little bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. find out what they can do for you, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. Now, our special guest today, along with Chris, who's going to be interviewing as well, um, played for Southport, Aston Villa, of course, AFC Bournemouth, Tranmere Rovers, Carlisle, Motherwell, and also went to Hong Kong. It is a pleasure to welcome onto the show, Sean Teal. Evening, Sean. How are you? Very good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. And thank you for joining us on this special show. So let's start from where it all began. Um, you grew up in Southport as a kid. Um, do uh-huh. you tell us your earliest footballing memories growing up? Um, I think my, my, my first memory of ever playing football, I think I was six years old and uh, I'd gone down to a local park, uh, not as a part of a team and the uh, the manager that was there, a fellow called Tony Rimmer, told me kicking the ball about and asked me if I wanted the game. So, but in my early years, funny enough, I was a goalkeeper. So that sort of uh, muddies the pool a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sean, as a ch- as a child, who did you support when you were growing up? Uh, I was an Everton fan growing up. Um, I was an Everton fan till I was. Uh, 17 till they released me and then I hated them. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) I was actually going to ask you about that. So you did join Everton as a youngster, as you say. What was your time at Goodison like and was there any particular players that stood out during your time there? Yeah, my my, my time as a a, a kid there was was pretty difficult. By that time, um, I'd transitioned into a left back. Here we go. I must have played every position going. Um, I transitioned into a left back and because I was only a first year apprentice, obviously the lad that was there the year before me got to play all the games in, as it was then the A team. Um, and I struggled to get in the B team, to be honest, for whatever reason that the, the coach didn't fancy playing me. I got bits of games. Um, so I trained every day for nothing in a sense. It's a bit, it's a bit sort of, um, it knocks your confidence, I suppose, if you're not picked. Um, but I enjoy I enjoyed the experience of being training every day and and doing the the jobs as we used to do cleaning boots cleaning kit uh, getting everything ready at Goodison on a Friday for the match for match day um, I enjoyed all that and you know I made I made some good friends at, at, at Everton uh, and uh, you know a lot of them I still talk to I still see now and again so yeah I enjoyed it um, obviously when when I joined. Um, Howard Kendall wasn't the manager, and then he came in after after twelve months, and and that's when it all sort of really changed for me because he he just didn't fancy me as a player. So at seventeen, I was released. Fair enough. So how how did how did how was it playing for your uh, like local team? How was it playing for Southport? How did you find that? Um, really good. I sort of when when I started off, 
uh, back into non-league. Uh, I did the usual thing in them days. I wrote to a load of pro clubs, that, that Wigan, um, Huddersfield, all them kind of clubs that were fairly local. Um, and I played for Leeds in a, a game against Huddersfield, finished the game, played quite well at left back. And Alan Clark, who was then manager, just sort of said to me, listen, you've done really well, but we don't think you're any better than what we've got, so we won't offer you a contract. Um, which again was another kick in the teeth but you know it, it was tough to get and there was no money in the game in them days uh, and I got a phone call sort of about four days later from the the coach at uh, Huddersfield who, who basically offered me the chance to play in the reserves as a 17 year old play all the games um, and, and learn basically so you know I played left back with, with some with some very senior players at the time in the reserves so we got to play the likes of Aston Villa you know uh, United um, all the big clubs so you know learning curves wise it was great but they had no money there was, they were never going to offer me a contract so I decided to go back into non-league so I joined uh, a local club Berska FC um, and the same thing happened it was quite weird at the time but the same thing happened I went there and the then manager Brian Griffiths didn't pick me and it was like what's the point of me being here I'm not playing I was 17 I just wanted to play football so I yeah. I, uh, I signed for Ellesmere Port which is just over the Mersey uh, the other side of Liverpool um, with a manager called George Burns who just literally played me every game it was like you're playing and that's it you know you're, you're one of our best players you're playing and I played every game and loved it um, and then Southport came in for me uh, they just they just got a new manager who was uh, quite a character within non-league football. A, a footballer, a fellow called Bob Murphy, has passed away now. Um, he'd been manager at, at Mosley, who'd won everything, uh, and he'd come to Southport, and he had a he had a reputation of being no nonsense. Well, to be fair, we found that out fairly quickly because we uh, we trained in a gym uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if you lent on the wall, you got fined. Um, and his reason was there's no walls in, on a football pitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you get fined like 50p for leaning yeah. on the wall. If, wow. you, if you were sick or you, were, or you had the shit, or you had the shit, you were expected to turn up. And his answer to that was, well, if you've got the shit, put a nappy on. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he was, he was just a character. He was just, he was, he was really invested in the players, you know, worked hard with the players. Yes, he was a disciplinarian. I mean, a, a young centre after it was the Southport lad broke his nose in a game. And uh, the week later, he sat in the dressing room, uh, waiting to be picked for the game. And, and Bob came in and said to, to Rob Sturgeon, the lad, uh, how's your nose? And he went, oh, it's, fi it's fine, boss. You know, I'm fit to play. So he picked the ball and threw it in his face. Wow. <laughs> and of course, it hit, and of course, it hit him right in the nose, and he squealed like a pig. Um, <laughs> but that was that. That that was Bob. You, you knew exactly where you stood from day one. You know, if you if you were going to be an arsehole, you weren't going to be in the team, or you weren't even going to be in the club. He was going to, uh, he was going to just get rid of you. So, uh, so that was my that was my early memories of Southport. Um, and then, <laughs> funny enough, that the said manager at Berska, Brian Griffiths, got the job. Um, and of course, things became difficult again for me because he, just, he obviously didn't fancy me. Although I played, he, he obviously really didn't fancy me. Um, and we had a, we had a set two um, in, in a, an FA Trophy game. We'd, we'd drawn the quarterfinal at home to Kidderminster, one each, and we should have probably won the game in a, in a complete mud bath. And we went to Kidderminster four days later and the ground had frozen rock solid. It was like minus three. And we played the game. It was weird. The, the referee should have called it off. But unfortunately, by half time, we were 5 0 down. And uh, walked in the dressing room, heads down, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves. And he came in, the manager, and started just, just mouthing off about this, that, and the other. And I'm having a cup of tea, literally just drinking my cup of tea. And I said under my breath, what, what's the fucking point? And uh, at that, he walked over and, and cracked the bottom of the cup right into my teeth and broke two of my teeth. So you can imagine my reaction being the calm individual that I am. I picked him up by the scruff of his neck and put him up against the wall. And I was just about, to, I was I was literally just about to 
throw a punch. And our assistant manager, who, you, who you'll remember well, Davy Jones, who was a Southampton boss, uh, yeah. grabbed my arm. <laughs> and it was probably a good thing he did. Because, yeah. you know, shit, shit, shit sticks in football and that would have followed me everywhere. Um, yeah. And obviously, well, obviously I got I got suspended and, you know, it was like he wanted me out of the club then as quick as, as quick as he could. Wow, is that is that how your move ended up? Is that how your move to Weymouth sort of started? Uh, yeah, that was that was the the catalyst to it. I went to Northwich Victoria, obviously, as you as you uh, probably know. I went to Northwich. Um, they were bottom of the table, with about eight games to go. Everybody wrote us off as going down, and, and uh, the the manager that came in brought in like six new lads, um, and we just didn't lose. We went to Weymouth, funny enough, and won at Weymouth, which not a lot of people did in them days. Uh, yeah. And I don't think, I, I think we drew two and, and won four and beat the drop. So, uh, obviously, I went back there for the start of the following season. I'd been there. I don't even, I, I'm not sure if I'd even played a game. I might have played two games and Weymouth came in for me. So, oh. Northwich had paid 2,500 quid for me um, as a fee. And then Weymouth came in and paid 25 grand, which uh, in those days was a lot of money. Um, mm, yeah. They just sold. They'd obviously just sold the old ground and gone to the new ground at Radipole Lane. Um, so that was us. That was us. Pack up. You know, I had uh, obviously I had, I had Carol, my wife. Um, it wasn't my wife at the time, but Carol, my girlfriend, uh, her son, Jason, uh, and then by that time we'd already had our. Literally, when we moved down, Ryan was six weeks old, and and Nathan was. Uh, 14 months old so it was a big upheaval you know um, but Weymouth knew how to do it we, they gave us a house um, we paid them uh, I don't think we paid rent actually I think we just paid the bills um, so life was good we were in Weymouth we are on the south coast beautiful part of the world Weymouth um, brand new stadium uh, brand new team because it had, Stuart Morgan had completely rebuilt built the team obviously you'll know who Stuart is Um and uh, we set off, and we 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 were flying. We were we were us and Barnet were the two best teams in the league, and we should have won the league. But we had massive issues with flooding at the new ground, and ended up playing. I think we played six games away on the bounce, uh, and it broke us in the end. And Barnet r- ran away with it. Um, and then the move to Bournemouth came. O- off the back of that, we started the next season. Uh, the team struggled like hell; couldn't get going. And then all of a sudden, Stuart said to me, uh, Harry Redknapp's coming for you, you're going to Bournemouth. Or well, you're going to speak to him anyway. So that was that. I went down to, to Bournemouth, met Harry, um, sorted a deal out. And uh, that was me. Up, up sticks again over to Bournemouth. What was your biggest memories of the early days down at Dean Court? Uh, well, it, I mean... In a way, I suppose uh, someone else's bad luck was my good luck because uh, I joined, uh, I think my first game I was on the bench against West Brom. Um, I was already cooked out, so I couldn't play in that United game where, you know, we went to Old Trafford and, and unfortunately for Sean O'Driscoll, he scored an own goal. Um, and then uh, Kevin Bond had... Uh, a real bad pelvic injury that was going to need surgery and meant he was out for the rest of the season. So that would mean I'd get, I think, five or six games at the end of that season, sort of with nobody challenging me because there was just, by that time, it was just me and John Williams as centre back, obviously Paul Morella and, and Martin Newson as the fullback. So I got what I consider a real lucky break. Um, and my biggest memory, in a way, was I, I went into the team and in all honesty, I didn't find any difference from playing at Weymouth. I just played my own game. I just played as I'd always played. You know, people know I, d- I did like a tackle now and again. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I liked I liked the physical challenge of the game. So if somebody wanted to butt heads with me, I was more than happy to butt heads back. Um, and I just settled in, and me, me and Willow ended up with a, a good relationship on the pitch. Uh, obviously, Mozzie on my left side worked. Um, you know, as far as legends go at Bournemouth, Mozzie is probably as big as anybody. 
Um, and Noose was captain on the right hand side, and it just worked. You know, we, Harry tinkered with the midfield. You know, Sean Brooks uh, and a few others were in and out. Obviously, we had Luther up front, and for the best part, it was Trevor Aylock with Luther. Um, and then obviously, um, things were good. You know, I, I, I'd settled in. I really enjoyed it. We were living out on uh, Southbourne Overcliff right over the beach so the wife was happy the kids were happy i'd go to work they go on the beach um <laughs> and it was just it was just a great experience those early days um games wise i sort of remember them i sort of don't remember it's that long ago now um but coming on against west brom was a big one uh making my debut coming on as a sub uh, and not feeling out of place. I think that was a, that was the main thing for me. I didn't feel out of place, you know, in training. I didn't feel out of place. I didn't feel like I was being made a fool of by anybody. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I ended up having a, a good rapport with all my teammates. You know, I, I didn't have an issue with any of the lads. We had a we had a real solid bunch of players who, who enjoyed being in each other's company and playing. Mm. And who who would you say was the most talented player in that squad? Oh wow! <laughs> um, <laughs> wow! Uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, to be honest, probably probably Sean Brooks, as in natural talent. You know, he was yeah. a he was a player. Um, uh, well, I say that, and uh, I'm thinking back to players that were there now. And obviously, Bish was a uh, Ian Bishop was a massive influence on the team. You know, the yeah. one thing about Ian, the one thing about Ian was everything could go through Ian. You know, he could he could pass long, he could pass short, he could get forward, he could get in the box, he could score goals. Um, so probably, probably uh, Brooksy and, and Ian Bishop were the two the two uh, biggest talents at the time. Obviously, yeah. everybody knows about Luther and his goal scoring ability. Um, but but we've known that for ages. We've known what Luther was all about before he even came to Bournemouth. So you know, it wasn't a surprise to see Luther banging goals in. No. <laughs> and. Of course, um, you were injured at the back end of the season where we were relegated. How frustrating was it to have to watch on at the back end of that year? Mm-hmm. And do tell us a little bit more about the injury that ended the season. Um, the, the injury was was a very strange one. We'd played at we'd played at Port Vale. Um, funny enough, on my birthday on, on March the tenth of that year, um, and Paul Molden obviously uh, hadn't been picked and, and had a bit of a huff about it. And we trained on the Monday morning and quite quite strangely, Harry had, had had a full-size game, which we never really did on a Monday. Um, and, and Paul had done. And uh, I went into a challenge with Paul and he went right over the top of the ball and straight through my kneecap, um, tearing my, my medial again and clean out the bone. So I knew straight away I was in trouble. Um, my, my knee was very, very unstable. Um, so, you know, it was frustrating, obviously, you know, with the, the whole thing that went on after that, the relegation, the Leeds game. Um, it was just it was just a bad time. It, you know, I, I was never good when I wasn't involved. So being in the gym on my own, uh, trying to build my leg up again was, was boring, if anything. Um, it's not very hard work. And if I'm right in remembering, um, didn't Paul never play for the club again? Say that again, sorry. Um, Paul never played for the club again, though, did he? After no, that Harry challenge. told him straight away. Harry was Harry was that angry at what he'd done, um, and I think I think you know probably Harry at the end of that season would have would have put a certain amount of blame on us going down on Paul's head. You know, thinking that if he had his two natural centre halves, we had a chance of winning games. But you know, I, I, I'm sure Paul didn't mean it to, to to cause the damage he caused. You know, he was just he was just frustrated and angry, and he went for a challenge that probably he would never normally go for. Um, and and I I ended up on the receiving end of it. What what was your relationship with Harry overall? Um, my relationship with Harry while I was at the club was good until. Um, I got injured, and then, um, for for whatever reason, uh, he started playing games. So, uh, my wife went to the club. Uh, a friend of mine drove my wife to the club to get uh, my mail, 
Um, because I was in a full length cast, so I couldn't go anywhere. Um, mm. and Harry came flying into the car park and basically, um, started screaming and shouting at Carol, um, you're this, you're that, you're the other. Um, and then of course he wrote, he wrote the book, um, which was just plain fantasy to say that Carol tried to run him over was a, was a fantasy because she wasn't even driving. So mm. You know why? Why write that? Uh, and why try and just why have, why attack a player's wife? I don't get that. Um, you know he didn't have to say that. Why he chose to say it, I don't know because he won't say. It. Well, I won't speak to him anyway. I couldn't speak to the man. You know I've got no respect for him after what he said. Um, so of course uh, the the villa the the villa move uh, came up, and uh, to be honest, I was more I was more than glad to get out of there and get away from Harry. And she joined Aston Villa in 1991, um, and it was a very successful time. Um, of course, you won the League Cup, you came runners up in the uh-huh. Premier League. What was it like at Villa, and especially your partnership with Paul McGrath in the centre of defence? Yeah, I mean, I, again, um, I joined Villa, and, and sort of when you join a big club like that from from a smaller club in which Bournemouth is. You, you never know how the land lies. You never know if you've been bought to play or you've been bought to be part of a squad. Um, and uh, we went. I, I, I literally signed. I, I spoke to. I spoke to. I spoke to Ron on the Sunday, and I was in Birmingham by the Tuesday. Signed everything, and we flew. That day we flew to to Germany for preseason camp. Um, so. I didn't have an awful lot of time to, to get to know the lads before we were in Germany. Um, but but I suppose going on a camp actually worked because you're in a you're in an enclosed environment. You know, you're not all going home every night. You're in a hotel for, for the best part of 10 days. So you get to know the lads pretty quick. And uh, it was just, you know, right from the start, the, the, the quality of the players you could see was the step up there. You know the the whole thought process of, of how the how the team is going to play and how the clubs run. You know it, it's just different. And then of course we come back and I go to Villa Park and I'm like gobsmacked because it's so big and you don't realise when you sign what you're signing into. Um, and Villa Park is just an extraordinary stadium. And, you know it is today. It's not changed that much. There's a few new stands and a few of the older ones gone, but it's just a, a magnificent. Stadium, and I, I love going to the games. I love going and watching and, and doing the corporate hospitality, and you know, meeting that, meeting some of the ex players I played with and didn't play with, um, and and chatting with the fans. And of course, Paul McGrath was, you know, your centre um, fellow centre back in defence, um, and you built up such a good relationship with him. You know, do tell us a bit more about that. Um. My relationship with Paul, with Paul was brilliant, um, literally right from the start. Uh, he'd been he, his his defensive partner before me was Kent Nielsen, uh, and Derek Mountfield was there. So there was a there was there was a there was a glut of um, there was a glut of centre So like I said, I didn't know where I stood. So anyway, we we did the preseason. Uh, I played him um, Paul Paul Birch's testimonial game because he'd gone to Wolves and that was sort of the inkling that I was in his plans right from the start and then of course with the first game was Sheffield Wednesday away uh, and I was picked so the first Premier League uh, the first um, game of the season I was I was in the starting lineup, which was a you know a big confidence boost for me um, Paul was easy to play with Paul was Paul was such a natural player that you know he made things look so easy that that was Paul all over. So you 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 you'd think he couldn't reach a ball, or he was not quick enough to get to it. And invariably, he'd get there. He wasn't the biggest talker in the world, if I'm honest. Not on the pitch, anyway. He'd um he'd sort of he'd let me do the talking. I, I've got a big mouth. I was always a talker. Um, so for me, it was quite easy. Um, and put, and we we settled into a, a a partnership where you know people say about um telepathy but we just settled into a partnership that works we got on well we got on well on and off the pitch um and we we just it just worked we clicked straight away really clicked um 
and it was as though we knew what each other was thinking. Um, but as I said, Paul wasn't a big a big talker, so I'd get things like on the pitch, um, Paul had gone win a header, and I'd, I'd shout, some, well done, Paul, and I'd, I'd just get that look. He'd just give me a look as if to say, it'll be yours next, make sure you win it. Um, and then... We we got the old we got the old scenario where if Ron ever had a go uh, ever had a go as well that while the game was going he shout things like he shout things to us and Paul would just shout to me or say to me just put your hand up so he, make sure he knows you've heard him uh, but we'll just do our own thing anyway <laughs> so <laughs> that's basically how it ran we we, we we just literally we just literally played our own game um and yes we're getting the change room after and Ron and say you pair of you know, so you, you know, you heard me and you've ignored me, blah 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 blah. Um, but then he'd say, like, well played. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he, Ron, Ron trusted Paul. Ron was a massive Paul fan. You know, it, it's legendary the stories about Paul and his drinking um, and what went on. But you know, Ron would always back Paul. You know, if he if he did miss a game, he only ever missed two games in four years while I was there due to due to drinking. Um, uh, and and Ron said he was fine, but you know we know he was never fine. Ron wouldn't find him. Ron thought the world of him. In, so in that time in the Premier League, who was the toughest opposition striker to play against, and why? Well, we had um, you know we had the, we had the usual people. Ian Wright was very difficult to play against. Ian was one of those players that he'd get in your head uh, before he'd actually before he'd actually turn you over on the pitch so you get things like um he'd stand next to me and he'd go and obviously my, my first my first meeting with uh Ian Wright was when he was at Palace and I was at Bournemouth and we had a we had a, a massive ding dong at Sellers Park me him and Mark Bright um and he remembered it so he, 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 he we'd be I'd be sort next to him at, at Highbury and he'd be saying to me hey Teeny how are you doing How's things, mate? How's how's it? What's it like at the villa? Blah blah. And next thing, because he'd got my he'd got my attention, the ball would come over the top and he disappeared. And he was quick, very quick. Um, so you learn to deal with people like Wrighty, um, which usually meant flattening it as many times as I could in the first <laughs> ten minutes. Uh, and then and then of course you've got the other side of it, the physical side of it, with with Alan Shearer, you know, and and. You know, I don't need to speak about Alan here. Everybody knows what Alan was about. Everybody knows he was he was tough when he put himself about. The one thing about Alan is, if you kicked Alan or elbowed Alan, you could guarantee it was coming back twofold. Um, yeah. So you had to be pre- you had to be prepared. Then we, then we had the, the likes of the Wimbledon lads, you know, uh, Vinnie Jones and, and Big John Fash. But I always enjoyed them games because they were always physical and you could get away with a few a few nasty challenges. Um, you might take a few, but you could get away with a few as well. <laughs> Fair enough. That Villa side was it. You come so close to winning the Premier League that season. Um, and, yeah, but of course you did win the League Cup. Um, I'm sure it was absolutely soul destroying at the time to miss out just by that whisker. But you know what. <laughs> How did you deal with that um, once it had happened? Um, it was tough at the time because obviously I think we, I think at one point we were seven points clear of the United, um, and we just really started to struggle. We couldn't we couldn't win games. We I think we we lost to Oldham at home. We drew with Coventry, things like that, and you know those were the games you had to win because um, United weren't going to lose many. Uh, and, and, you know, we ended up, I think we lost it by 10 points in the end. So, you know, they walked away with it in the end. And it was it was soul-destroying at the time. But obviously, we came back the next season, um, regrouped. Uh, I think, you know, a few other players were added to the squad. Um, and then 94, obviously, we beat United at Wembley, which was a, which was a massive thing. Um, you know, so we... Uh, you know, it was it was a bit of retribution for for them doing us in the league. You did leave Aston Villa in nineteen ninety five and then joined Tramway Rovers, so you headed back up to the northwest, um, quite close to Southport. Um, were you happy to return? Yeah, um obviously ninety five I went to I went to I left and went to Tramway. Um it was all a bit it was all 
strange way it happened. Um, uh, Villa had offered me, or Villa were going to offer me a new contract. Brian Little had took over and, and told me they were going to offer me a, a new deal. He didn't, he didn't specify years or or money or anything. It was just agreed that we'd sit down and talk a new deal out. And then, um, and then I, my agent phoned me um, in the middle of the summer and said he spoke to he spoke to Brian, or well, Brian had phoned him, and they were they were. They were 90, 95% sure they were going to um, sign Chris Coleman from Crystal Palace for three million quid, which basically meant that I would be sort of surplus to requirements and I'd be sat in the stand, you know, for the majority of the season. So um, he asked me what I wanted to do. So I said, you know, listen, I was 31, I think, at the time, and I just... I just wanted to play football. I didn't want to be sat at stand at 31, wasting my career away. So I said, no, if, if the right offer comes in, I'll go. Um, and he said, well, yeah, I thought that's what you would answer. So um, the one thing I will promise you is I will let you go for as cheap as I can. Um, uh, and he stuck to that. You know, I, I left I left the, the 450 grand, went to Tramir, um and the deal was done. And, and in a way, Financially, it was it was a, a fantastic move for me because um, money wise, I was I was the deal I got at Tranmere. I would never have got it at, at Villa anyway. Um, as record signing, obviously they they pushed the boat out and, and the, the deal um, helped me secure you know long term financial needs over the next you know twenty thirty forty years. With Tranmere, they'd um, recently been in the playoffs, if I remember correctly. Um, they were quite a yeah, four, strong four, team. Yeah, four years sure. on the run. Yeah. Four years on the run they were, they were in. Um, so I was, I think I was seen as the final piece in the jigsaw to push and get all the way. Um, and it just never happened. Uh, I, got, I, I, I had a, a double hernia operation uh, halfway through the season. Johnny King got sacked. John Aldridge came in. Uh, I was back in the team as captain by that time. Um, but uh, John Aldridge didn't want me in the club. He wanted me out of the club. He, he obviously, becoming manager, he found out what my wages were like and what they were paying me. And he wanted that money for other players. So he wanted me out of the club. So he stripped me of the captain and threw me out of the team, basically. Um, not in the most not in the most professional way, really. He wouldn't speak to me. He ignored me. He dragged me around. He made me train with the kids and all the usual things that went on in that time in football um, so it was a it was a, a real um, it was a real difficult time for me, I, you know, I'd, I'd been so used to playing and now I find myself as an outcast um, so I had, a, I had a very brief spell at Preston on loan for three weeks, uh, which, which gave me a bit of breathing space and I played a few games uh, and then I got a phone call off an old uh, Weymouth uh, teammate uh, Peter Guthrie, the keeper, asking me if, if I fancy going to Hong Kong. So I'm like, oh. Uh, so my, my first question, obviously, was, uh, what's the money like? <laughs> and he went, well, yeah, exactly. He went, well, you'll be the only, you'll be the only former Premier League player in the league. So I think you'll find you'll be all right. Anyway, I spoke to a, I spoke to a Mr. Chan which is not a surprise in Hong Kong, I don't suppose. And um, he, uh, they, they basically offered me the same money I, I was on at Tranmere. So it was, it was a no-brainer. I, I had to go for three months on loan. I had to get out of Tranmere and play games. Um, so the next morning I went in to see Mr. Aldridge, uh, told him, and he, his, his instant reaction was, um, what a great move that is for your career. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, are you fucking real? So much Hong Kong is a career move, really. Anyway, I, I pulled a, I pulled a, I pulled a fast one on him. So I said, "Listen, I can't go. I just can't go." He said, "Well, why, why not? Why can't you go?" I said, "Well, they'll only pay me half my wages, half, half my contract that I'm on here." Oh, don't worry about that. He says, "We'll pay the other half." So I got my own back a bit, so I earned another half on top of my wages. So I was quick in. <laughs> well, you have to be, you have to be behind me. Trust me. So with that, with that, with that, within two days, I was on a plane to Kuala Lumpur to, to join up with the team. Um, 
and of course it was an experience um it was an experience simply because the, the heat you had to play in the the mentality of the hong kong players and the hong kong uh, league as such um and it took a bit of getting used to you know this this whole winning a tackle and going through someone and making as much wreckage as you can was seen as the was not taken too kindly over there. I had a I had a I had another ally in our team in Martin Cool, who you probably remember as well from Portsmouth. And uh Cooley to be fair, liked to fight. He liked to get he liked to get under people's skin and it wasn't difficult with the Chinese to set them off. Um so we we did have our issues. <laughs> <laughs> but I I ended up I stayed for three months and then I jumped on the plane and came home uh, and I got a phone call from the owner of the club telling me he was going to sue me for everything I had because I'm breaking my contract with with the club in Hong Kong and I'm like no uh, I signed for three months no you didn't sign for a year uh, and the whole argument thing so I said well I'll tell you what phone phone the English FA see what they say and phone me back so he phoned the English FA phone me back five minutes later. Capping on, oh Sean, listen, I'm really sorry, I got it all wrong, Bob. Will you come back and I'll give you some more money? <laughs> so you can guess what happened. I jumped on the plane and went straight back. <laughs> um, it, it, it makes me sound greedy, but you know it's a short career and you've got to make what you can. Um, you know, if it had been earning the money they're earning nowadays, then I wouldn't have been running around like an headless chicken, taking whatever I could get. But you know, it, it, it was what it was. I stayed the rest of the season and then they, they released me because they just couldn't afford to keep me for another season on what they were paying me. Um, mm. So I, I came back to, to home in town where I live uh, or where I still live and um, just went back into normal life, chilling out a bit, took a few weeks off and then uh, I got a phone call from um, Motherwell. Um uh, Chucky from um, Man United, Brian McClare had gone back up there, left United gone back up there and he was seen as being um, you know uh, groomed to be the next manager type thing, anyway he, he phoned me up uh, and basically said to me listen we um, we're looking for an experienced centre back do you fancy coming up so the next day I'm in the car and I'm up to Motherwell um, trained, trained with the lads uh, played in a played in a game uh, a friendly against Le Havre at uh, Fair Park Motherwell, and they offered me a contract instantly, um, and I signed a I signed two year two year contract three year contract three year contract um, on on decent money to be fair you know I, I was quite happy I was still playing I was by this time I was thirty four I think um, and I enjoyed my time up at Motherwell uh, it was really good. I got sacked, <laughs> 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 which, which, which to be fair, not many footballers can say they got sacked. But I, I um, we went on a they, they used to have the, the mid season break, um, you know, because of the weather in Scotland. So, and we went to Tenerife to do a like a mini pre season camp. And we were getting snippets through from the press that were over there about what was being said in the papers. And uh, they'd spoke to me, uh, Motherwell, about a new deal. Um, but nothing had ever been mentioned about money or anything. They just sort of, Billy Davis, who was then the manager, had sort of said, so much to have a new deal. When, when, it, when it transpired, it, it, it wasn't quite as straightforward as that. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of ducking and diving. People didn't want to speak to me about it. Um, and we went, we, went on this, we went on this pre-season, uh, this mini pre-season thing. And uh, there was, a, there was a, an incident where a, a snippet in a paper basically said Billy Davis had said well if the big man thinks he's getting what he's asked for he's got no chance so we got back on the Sunday and Derek McGregor who you might well remember from uh, the Bournemouth paper um, phoned me up and uh, or I phoned him sorry actually and uh, I said listen do you want an exclusive and I absolutely let rip I came I came the manager I came the owner I came Pat Nevin who was like a uh, in charge of day to day, and when I say came them, I came them. You know, I left no stone unturned about you know treating treating players like a piece of meat, blah blah blah, lying to people, did this that. Other. So they uh, they suspended me for two weeks. Um, so I sat at home, I went running every day, I kept fit. Um, 
but I was never going back. I took my boots with me that day because I knew I was never going back. There was no returning from what had happened. And they they sat me, they sat me two weeks later. Um, and that's how I ended up at Carlisle to finish my pro career. I went there. How uh, Martin Wilkinson was manager, lovely bloke, one of the one of the, the nicest people you can meet in the game. Um, didn't want the job really. Took the job because he was forced to take the job by Michael Knight, and if you'll remember his name from the Man United thing, running on the pitch, juggling the ball. Um, and he was an absolute fruitcake, Michael Knight. Um, so. At the end of the season, at the end of the season, they actually offered me the manager to play a manager's job, um, which of course was the next step I wanted. I wanted to get into that side of the game, um, and when it transpired, I went away for two weeks, and when I came back, Ian Atkins was the new manager, and I'd been just binned completely. So that was my pro career. I, I, I took the decision then at thirty six, stroke thirty seven, that my body didn't need it every day. Um, you know, I'd put a lot into the game. I took. A- a lot of knocks over the years. Um, so I went back into non-league and funny enough, guess where I came back to? Southport. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and I carried on my career there. I carried on my career there. I had I had uh, a couple of years there. Then I was offered the player manager's job at Bursco. So that was the step in I wanted to in management um, for my one glorious season, obviously winning the FA Trophy, uh, playing in the final at Villa Park at 40, you know, they were they were all milestones within my career. Um, and then I got sat five weeks later. <laughs> and it was like, this is ridiculous. You know, I just, there, there was no common sense in why they sat me. They just, uh, uh, football reasons, that's what they put it down to. And in, in reality, it was just that I was a, I was a, I was a bigger pull than the, the chairman and the secretary and then people when they didn't like it. Everything sort of went around me, where we stayed, what we did, how we trained, when we trained, when we didn't train. And they just didn't like it. You know, they wanted to run the club their way, not my way. So I left and uh, I ended up at Chorley as, as player manager and then packed into playing sort of a few months after joining. Um, and then uh, I made the decision to buy a pub. So I bought a pub, which is the worst thing I ever did because I lost a fortune in it. Um I'm packed in playing. I just packed in. I, 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 with three games into the season, we've beaten, been beaten three times. We've cut the budget to nothing. And I just, I resigned and walked away from the game. Um, and that was me, really. You know, uh, I've, I've done a bit of coaching. I went over to the States for three years and did three years out in Atlanta coaching, which was fantastic. I wish I'd never come back, if I'm quite honest. Um, and I, uh, I started doing some work for Villa uh with uh, Mark Lillis, a former pro at Villa, and we went over to China and did a camp over there. We went to Australia and did a camp. Um, and now I'm happily settled down back into my business building. So that's my life in a nutshell, I suppose. Oh, excellent stuff. Do you think you'd ever go back into football, or do you think that's you've gone past that now? I think that's passed me by now. I'm 58 now, so... I think you know it's becoming a it's becoming a young man's game. Somebody who can you know go and do all the badges and I you know I, I didn't want to I, I did my my very first badge and I, you know I just didn't want to do any more. I probably should have stuck at it and got you know through to be licensed or whatever. But I just I didn't want to do it. I, I didn't have the I didn't have the um, the push to go and sit in the classroom and do you know work at home on on training techniques and this that and the other. I just didn't want to do it. So, you know, no, I think my life's my life now. You know, I'm happily married. I've been with Carol 37 years. Um, we get on like a house on fire. We always have done, you know. And, and you know, I'm a builder. I have a lad that works with me. Who I get on great with. And uh, you're pinching my building time. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, so, so you know, it, it, life, life's good. I enjoy my life. You know, I do. I work very, very hard. Um, probably too hard at the fifty-eight. You know, I probably should be looking at, at, you know, slowing down and having more holidays. But you know, I've got some big jobs to get done. Once they're done, then you know, we will take a holiday. We will go over to the states and see all our friends. You know, um, and I'll still go down to. I still go down to Villa. Like I said, I still go to the home games. Uh, the majority of them. I still go up at hospitality. So 
you get a small wage out of that and it's good fun meeting people, talking to the fans. I love talking to the fans. I get I have a real good rapport with with the, the Villa fans. Um I, I have a good rapport with all the fans I played with. You know, I had I had a good rapport when I was at Bournemouth with the fan circus. I used to go into the club after the game and have a drink and play pool and, you know, chill out. Um hmm. and that that was just me. You know, I, I, the the fans are what pays your wages. Well, they don't anymore, but you know what I mean. That was always that was always the thing. The fans pay your wages. The fans are entitled to say what they say about you. Um, and I think you know, I, I stand, uh, I stand quite high up in a lot of Aston Villa fans. Uh, you know, top ten, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. As a defender, of course, you didn't score many goals, um, understandably. No. But is there any goal which is a particular favourite that you remember? Uh, well, well, obviously, the, the Trammy semi-final at Villa Park. We were I, I missed the first game through being suspended, so we were three we were three one down, um, and I was fortunate enough to to score the second goal at Villa Park to level the tie up with a diving header. Um, you know, and and whenever I speak to people at Villa, whenever we the game always comes up anyway because people think it was the best game they've ever seen at Villa Park and mm-hmm. so be it the, the, the goal the goal always comes up so you know uh, it, it's just a goal that's embedded in my in my history and in my memory and uh, you know I, I watch it now and again on, on YouTube and it, it, it it's just a moment in time that I'll never ever get back again Um mm-hmm. The only other, the only other, I took a few penalties which don't get included in very many stats. But the other one was the FA Trophy semi final against Aylesbury. We'd drawn at Aylesbury 1 1, and we were 0 0, uh, 0 0 with two minutes to go. And uh, let's just say uh, my little centre forward, Peter Wright, got a little nudge in the back and went down like he'd been shot. Um, and the referee gave a penalty. Uh, and I made the decision. I'd, I'd always took penalties anyway. It never bothered me. And I, I just, I, I picked the ball up and, and made the decision that if anybody should should miss and we don't get through to the final, then it should be on my shoulders. Um, it was my team. I was player manager. So I put the ball down and uh, smacked it down the middle. We won one nil. So it got us to the final at Villa Park, which was, for me, which at forty was just uh, unbelievable to go back there. We were treated like lords. Uh, Doug Ellis was still alive then, so. We were given body more heath to train at. Um, they washed our kit after training for us. We stayed in a nice hotel. We got a tour of Villa Park. You know, I took my assistant manager Ray to meet Doug Ellis. We just they just looked after us so well to the point where after we'd won, after we beat Tamworth two one, Doug Ellis came in the dressing room to congratulate everybody, which he didn't have to do that. You know, Doug Ellis is a is a legend in his, in his own right. Um, you know, so he didn't have to put himself out and do that, but he did. He came to the game and watched the game we won, and he came, came and congratulated us after, which, which I just thought showed, showed uh, what the man was all about. Yeah, most definitely. Um, final question, Sean, um, that's come to mind. Of course, you did enjoy the tough games um, and was a tough centre back during your time. But what would you say is the most enjoyable? Difficult physical game that you was involved in. Oh wow! Probably at Wimbledon. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Vinny Jones released a video. Um, uh, football hard men, and he got oh, yeah. fined twenty five. He got fined twenty five grand by the FA, which in them days was a lot of money. Uh, and and for whatever reason. Ron Atkinson decided we'd watch this video before we, we jumped on the coach to go down and play Wimbledon. So we watched the video, and as I'm walking out, uh, the, Sun, the Sun reporter uh, asked me a question. What, what did you think of the video? And I just playfully said, well, I think Vinny's mad, but, you know, getting 25 grand for that. You know, uh, I, I called him, I, I gave him a name, I said something. Anyway, I got up the next day and it's all over the paper. <laughs> it's in the sun, double page, inside the thread. Uh, and it just, it, it, I got down to breakfast and, and the lads are all sniggering. Um, Have you seen this, Tealy? Look at this. And I'm like, oh, shit. So th- the, the only bonus was Vinny was, Vinny was um, suspended, so he couldn't play in the game. So 
it wasn't going to be one of those games. But obviously, Fash was still playing, and Fash knew all about it. And uh, they used to have a they used to have a kickoff where Fash would go wide, obviously pull the centre back wide to, to mark him. They'd lob the ball, up and Fash would go and smash someone's head off. Um, so I was the one that was detailed to go and jump with him. So I knew what was I, I knew what would be coming. Anyway, as we jumped, I caught the back of his leg, and he pulled his hamstring. <laughs> <laughs> and he landed, he landed, he landed in a heap and got got carried off. Um, so it wasn't really a long thing, but it was it was a nervous time because you knew something was going to happen within uh, within the ninety minutes. But it didn't in the end because fast didn't last two minutes. So I got away with it. <laughs> Do you think football misses um, hard men? Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. I think the game's changed that much. It, it's not the same game anymore. You know, it changed <laughs> completely now. Yeah, I completely agree with that. You, you look at the likes of yourself, um, like you say, Vinny, you've got Duncan Ferguson yeah. at Everton. Um, Roy Keane. Yeah. Roy Keane, yeah. Um, yeah. And I yeah. think football is missing that now. And I it's do. a real shame. I do. You know, all this, all this falling over, holding your face when, when you've had a, you know, when you've got caught on your arm. I just, I don't get it. I don't get why people have to play the game like that. You know, play the game as it was meant to play. It's a physical game. It's a, you know, it's a contact sport. Well, it was a contact sport. And I just think they've ruined it to a point now. Thank you so much for joining us on this show, Sean. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And all the very, very best with your business. And yeah, thank you. You've left You're some welcome. real good memories, both at Dean Court and, of course, at Villa as well. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. And thank you, everybody, for joining me on this special show. Please do remember to hit the like, the subscribe and the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos that we do here on Up the Cherries in All Departments. Please do remember to check out all of our interviews. We recently had Paul Mitchell on the show. We've also had Steve Cook, Steve Fletcher, of course, Harry Redknapp, amongst many other. And, of course, Lufa Blizzard as well. So until the next video, Up the Cherries, and I'll see you in the next one.